We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. William Shakespeare, The Tempest. This interview that I, Dr. Jamison Neruda, conducted with Sarah exposes a fundamental deception that affects humanity across every dimension of life. This deception is that our three-dimensional reality and human consciousness have been programmed to be perceived as real, when they are not. This is clearly a very bold assertion, and is not made lightly. In this interview, I explain the forces behind this deception, what their agenda is, how humanity has been enslaved from its inception to today, and what we can do about it. It is, understandably, an unsettling narrative. After all, it exposes a reality where humans are biological hosts of infinite beings, suppressed by deceptive programs designed by entities from a different dimension. Humanity is unaware that we live in a designed reality, and that that designed reality includes everything. Over the past 15 years, there have been individuals who have written and spoken about certain aspects of this deception. From the scientific community, individuals like Herman Verland, Dr. Robert Lanza, Leonard Susskind, Gerard Tehuft and James Gates. From the technical field, NASA engineer Thomas Campbell. From a more philosophical perspective, authors like Nick Bostrom and Anthony Peake. Scientific papers, too, have been released in this emerging field of reality definition like constraints on the universe as a numerical simulation by Bean, Davuti and Savage. These individuals, and others like them, are hypothesizing that our universe was designed through mathematics or computer code. This topic is relatively off-limits, reserved for theoretical and heretical thinkers. It shocks people significantly more than the discussions of UFOs or government conspiracies, because it is so fundamental. It is our reality, and the only logical conclusion we can draw is that we are prisoners in a deceptive reality. It makes reality feel like a lab, and we are the unsuspecting lab rats. From the spiritual side, many of our mystics and religious founders have reported that both our perception of the universe, and the universe itself, is an illusion. This theme is consistent in religious and spiritual writings throughout the ages. And while the mystics lack the scientific vocabulary to define the scope of this illusion, they nevertheless understood that we, as individuals, walk our lives through an illusory world that scientists are increasingly describing as a programmed reality. The question that rises to the top is, who or what is programming our reality and why? It is to this question that this interview seeks to answer and explain in layperson terms. It is understandable that those with a scientific or religious training will find this disclosure difficult, if not impossible, to believe. I am not trying to convince anyone, I merely present a narrative for how this happened, why it happened, where it is trying to lead humanity, and most importantly, how we can break out of the programming, all of us. This interview is not concentrated on the scientific realm. The science behind the hologram of deception is not based on the mathematics or physics of our space-time. Its complexity and sophistication is well beyond our current understanding, so the attempt to define it in scientific terms would be an impossible undertaking. Even if it were possible, it would only muddle the real import of this information in arcane vocabulary and mathematics. The true focus of this interview isn't the scientific definition of the hologram of deception, but rather how we can free ourselves from its pervasive and illusory presence. The sovereign integral process is defined in this interview in detail, but you may have to listen carefully to it and understand it. This process is truly the centerpiece of this interview. Whatever philosophical perspective you wish to attach to this information, bear in mind that it is shared in the spirit of oneness and equality, and that the sovereign integral process is a decidedly experiential practice. As thought-provoking as the backstory and the chessboard of reality, as depicted herein, may appear, it is the behavioral adjustments that are the real purpose of this disclosure. 
The Wingmaker's materials are not focused on knowledge or spiritual experiences. They are dedicated to the new behaviors that support the ongoing unfoldment of the sovereign integral process on Earth within the human species. It is this process that you are really experiencing in this interview. Whether you believe in the existence of the hologram of deception or not, the sovereign integral process remains available as a tool to use in your daily life. What we discussed Wednesday night has been swirling around me ever since. I think I've become a bit obsessed with all of this, what for me, anyway, is new information. I'm trying my best to process it into my mental framework, and I have to admit, I'm not sure it's working. I understand. I've held back some information for this very reason, not only for you, but also for those who will ultimately hear this. When we ended the last session, we agreed to spend more time on the Grand Portal. Is that what you're referring to, or is it something else? It's all related. It's a very, very big picture, and broad timeline. Can you share it now? Let's take it one part at a time. With your questions, I hope it will all come clear, but I have to warn you, that it will seem a little unwieldy or odd until the whole of it is out. Okay. Where do you want to start? I think we need to go back to the beginning, to understand the true context of the Grand Portal. The Grand Portal is defined in the Wingmaker's materials as the irrefutable, scientific discovery of the human soul. Okay. Earth was, and is, a very unique planet. It was entirely of water, originally. But what made it interesting to beings, was the fact that its core enabled it to have a gravitational force that supported manifestation. What do you mean by manifestation? That it began to traverse from an interdimensional planet of sound frequencies, to a planet of matter, a physical matter. Its gravity-producing core, or nucleus, was able to literally create the conditions that allowed it to materialize itself over eons of time. How do you know this history? There are records of this on the disk that was taken from the 23rd chamber at the ancient Arrow site. But some of this we knew from other documents we've retrieved from the Sumerian record that have not been widely distributed. We've also had discussions with the courtier that bear this out. So Earth started out as a water planet and it wasn't physical? Correct. This was when the Atlanteans lived within the planet. They were the race of beings that inhabited Earth at the time of its formation. The Anunnaki came to them and negotiated an agreement to allow the Anunnaki to mine a substance near the core of the planet. That would be, in its essence, what today we would call gold. These races of beings known as the Atlanteans and Anunnaki were not three-dimensional. They didn't possess bodies as we think of them today. Their existence was contained in a different range of frequencies, what we would call higher dimensional frequencies. Why did they want gold? The Anunnaki required it. The exact reason is unknown, but it had something to do with the way that gold modulated the frequency of their body. Gold was an essence to their race. It held a property that was vital to their survival. The record is a little vague as to exactly why it was so important. But these records mention that their entire planet had 12 major cities and all of them were made of a semi-transparent gold. Even the Book of Revelations refers to this. Who are these beings? I mean, I've heard of the Atlanteans, but never the Anunnaki. They're a race of trans-dimensional beings. The Atlanteans were the only race of beings on Earth at that time, and they, the Anunnaki, sought permission to set up mining on Earth, which the Atlanteans agreed to. The ancient Arrow site is known within the Wingmaker's materials as the extraterrestrial time capsule that was discovered in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. Why? They didn't see any harm in helping the Anunnaki. They weren't a competitor, because the Atlanteans were more numerous. The Atlanteans wanted to have an agreement with the Anunnaki, if only to befriend them for their technology. Also, the gold mining was in an area of Earth that was of little consequence to them. I don't see how this relates to the Grand Portal. It's a long story, and we just started, but I promise I'll come to that in a bit. Okay, that's fine. I'll be patient. The Earth began to materialize more and more. It began to harden in a sense. The gold with it, the Earth, and everything on it, was solidifying. The mining of the gold would soon become impossible for the Anunnaki because they'd be unable to mine the gold if it were in a dense, physical state. Why not? Their bodies were etheric. They could not mine the gold if it was physical. They needed to have bodies that would be able to operate on Earth and mine the gold. How quickly did this happen? I don't know. 
Our records don't stipulate the time scale, but I assume it was over tens of thousands of years. The point is that they needed to create a physical vessel like an astronaut would require a spacesuit to inhabit space. They tried hundreds of experiments and had the help of both the Atlanteans and Syrians. I assume this vessel is the human body? Yes, we call them physical uniforms sometimes. The wing makers refer to them as human instruments. So the Anunnaki created a physical body to mine gold. You mean like a robot or are you saying these were humans? No. These were the equivalent of ape men. They were pre-human by a long shot. But they were our predecessors. We sometimes refer to them as human 1.0. But oh, were they robots or biological? They were completely biological, but human 1.0s were not fully physical. They were partly etheric. You see, the Anunnaki and Syrians designed them to synchronize with the evolving densification of the Earth. So as the Earth solidified, so did the human instruments. If they were biological, did they have a soul? We wouldn't call them human if they did that. Remember I mentioned the Atlanteans? Yes. The Anunnaki and Syrians placed them, the Atlanteans, inside these human uniforms. These were very advanced beings, but apparently naive. They wanted to be in these ape men bodies and mine gold? No, that was not their interest at all. In fact, they allowed the Anunnaki to mine their gold, but as the earth began to solidify, they told them that if they could engineer a vessel to enable them to continue to mine their gold, that would be acceptable, but on a small scale. The Anunnaki had some kind of a falling out with the Atlanteans, and began to conspire with the Syrians and another race referred to as the Serpents. Each of these three races was interested in figuring out how to embody physical planets. They saw Earth as a laboratory of sorts to figure it out. The Anunnaki already had a human uniform. They simply needed to power it with a life source or soul. The bigger issue was how to get the Atlanteans into these embodiments, and keep them there. In effect, these three races conspired to enslave the Atlanteans within these pre-human vessels. The Atlanteans were the power generators, that made these biological entities operate. Are you saying these primitive ape men had powerful souls inside them? I don't understand how that would be possible. It's a very complicated subject. The wing makers wrote about the implantation of programs, inside the human uniform, even version 1.0. The Syrians were mostly credited with this invention, but it was the offspring of Anu, that really perfected these implants, by programming them. The human uniform, version 1.0, was designed by the Anunnaki, the implants were designed by the Syrians, and the programming of the implants was designed, and evolved, by a being known as Marduk. Anu was the leader of the Anunnaki. He was known as the Sky God, in Mesopotamian times. The Anunnaki were the deities, written about on the Sumerian text, known as the Royal Blood. That doesn't answer my question, as to how a powerful soul would suddenly be plugged into an ape-man vessel and behave like, like a Neanderthal. Well, First, these were much more primitive than Neanderthals. But the answer is in the implants. You see, the biological entity or ape man, as we're referring to it, was not able to operate in the physical world. They needed survival skills, how to eat, how to hunt, how to clean themselves, how to even move their bodies. All of these very fundamental functions were necessary to actually include or program into the vessel, which was the purpose of the functional implants. The implants were akin to the brain of the human 1.0, but it wasn't just in the brain. These implants were placed inside the body within various parts, like the chest area, middle back, wrists, ankles and so forth. The primary ones were contained in the skull. But generally these implants, were networked to operate from the head, or brain area. Why do you say the head or brain area and not simply the brain? Because it wasn't in the brain. Remember, that human 1.0 was still part etheric, and part physical. The implants also needed a similar consistency or sound vibration. They were placed into the bone or skeletal structure mostly, and some in the muscle tissue. These functional implants fused into the muscles in bone, including the DNA. The wing makers put it this way. The DNA integration was for the intelligence of the plan. The muscle tissue allowed the life essence to power the functional implant. There was a central coordination point, and that was in the brain but the implants were located throughout the body. This was an integrated system that was installed in the human uniform to allow it to be controlled, monitored, and programmed over time. It was the evolutionary stick and carrot. Doing it this way, 
allowed the early humans to dig out gold, which, as I said, was their primary purpose, initially. I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but I still don't get how such an advanced race as the Atlanteans could power these ape men and become slaves. It doesn't make sense to me. You have to understand that the implanted functionality was partly to make the human 1.0 and its power source, the life essence of an Atlantean, to function efficiently and effectively as miners. That was the prime goal. The second, however, was to suppress the power source, or in this case, the Atlantean beings inside the human vessels. They did this by making the power source ignorant of its origin, and the reality of its true expression, as an infinite being. When the Atlantean beings were placed inside the human uniform, they were essentially 100% focused on physical survival, and functional performance. There were no relationships. No marriage. No reproduction. These were essentially cloned beings. They were all the same in terms of their appearance and abilities. Human drones, piloted by implanted functionality, that the Atlantean beings inside became associated with, as them. The infinite inside the body, believed it was the body and the implanted functionality, and nothing more. What happened when they died? Let me be clear, these beings, the Atlanteans, were infinite, meaning they did not have space-time regulation. They lived after the body died. However, the Anunnaki created a set of planes, or dimensions of experience, that was the equivalent of a holding plane, that's what the wing makers called it, where they could be recycled. Recycled? As in reincarnation? Yes, later on this became the basis of reincarnation. It allowed the Anunnaki to recycle the Atlanteans. Some aspects of the implanted functionality were interdimensional, which is to say, it could assist in the delivery of the beings to the proper location within the holding planes of consciousness, and assist in their reincarnation back into a new vessel. But you said that they, the ape men didn't have reproduction? Not in version 1.0. These were very basic. But the Anunnaki could create them in large scale, so when one human uniform expired, let's say they had a mining accident, another would be made. These were clones. The ability to self-reproduce came in version 2.0. That was mostly because the amount of effort required to manage this process was enormous on the part of the Anunnaki. They wanted to create an automated system, something that wouldn't require them to orchestrate all of the variables. So the Syrians helped them to create the implants that could propagate through reproduction. This enabled automation of the recycling of the beings, from the holding planes, to be born into the physical dimension through a baby. So, this was all automated, by programming, technology? I don't know, this is too weird. The universe is made up of dimensions, that are a result of mathematical equations. It is constructed from mathematics. Some beings understand how to apply mathematical equations to organize and plan space-time. It's all created. This world is created, it's not real. It's a programmed reality. When I say plan, it can also be construed as control of space-time. That is to say, this is a programmed space-time reality. Once you can program space-time reality within a species like humanity, you can program at the individual level of a person, right down to when they itch their nose if you want to. It's all mathematical equations. I don't know what to say for now, I'll go along with you, but it really sounds like fiction to me. So, what happened to the ape men? I mentioned Marduk. He was intimately involved in the evolution of the species. That was his role. Of all the Anunnaki, he was the closest to the human 1.0s. He understood them and even admired certain aspects of them. Unconsciously, perhaps. He began to alter their programs so the human 1.0s behaved more like the Anunnaki. As they began to take on the characteristics of the Anunnaki, Anu and his sons, Enki and Enlil, were concerned by this. Marduk was programming emotions and feelings. He was evolving humans too quickly, but remember, this was the evolution of the functional implants, the interface between the power source, Atlanteans, and the human physical body. So it was the interface that was being evolved, which enabled the human body to show emotion to communicate, to sense more of the three-dimensional world called Earth, etc. The other thing that was happening was that as the Earth continued to become more of a three-dimensional solid, so did the human 1.0s and their functionality implants. This growing densification also made it easier to control and suppress the Atlantean power source inside the human uniforms. It was like a compression was taking place in and on this Earth plane, and it was deepening the gravity of focus on Earth plane survival. I wrote down the word serpents. 
Are you talking about literal serpents? No. Serpents as a race of beings. They simply were another race of beings based on reptilian DNA, but distinct from the Anunnaki. You could say they were related. They were known as life carriers. They seeded planets. They built food chains. You could say they were the grocers of the planet. But they didn't get involved in the creation of the human 1.0? Not in the technical sense. Their job was more to provide food and sustenance for it. I understand how the Atlanteans were suppressed in the human 1.0 because of the implants, but why did they go there? If they didn't volunteer as you suggest, how did they get forced into slavery when they were previously these powerful, sovereign beings? We don't know exactly how it happened. The record we read was not specific on this topic. But the tone, or word that was used, was that the Atlanteans were naive. They had no reason to think it would be possible to become enslaved. It would be like a concept that was never used in their culture. No one ever did that nor could they. You can't enslave an infinite being, unless, of course, you lock them into a human uniform. And that was the cunning of the Anunnaki and their Syrian partners. They launched this attack from such a bizarre angle, that the Atlanteans couldn't see it coming. I think it was an ambush or surprise attack. You said earlier that the human 2.0 could reproduce. How long of a time existed between 1.0 and 2.0, and what were their primary differences? Human 1.0 rose to a pretty high level in terms of being able to speak or communicate. That was the major add-on that Marduk brought to Human 1.0. However, the psychological state of being a clone was too hard for Human 1.0. They all looked alike and had the same thoughts, so communication was helpful to a point, for example, coordinating a task, but actually having individual ideas no. And this led to depression and psychological states where, according to the wing makers, they literally went mad. This flaw was a huge problem. Anu decided to wipe them out, and this is the story of the Great Flood. Marduk managed to save some of the human 1.0s from the flood along with other flora and fauna, but it was the end of human 1.0. Human 2.0 was then created. This was the stage where the humans could self-reproduce. And when this happened, some of the Anunnaki impregnated female humans and brought in their bloodlines to the human species. This began the variations. This began the idea that humans were no longer clones. The concern, however, was that human 2.0s might become too powerful and self-aware. What if the Atlantean power source became aware that it was an infinite being? This was when Anu decided that he should be God. Humans needed to have a lord or ruler over them so it was clear that they were inferior to an external ruler. This was a key part of their program of indoctrination. Working with Marduk and the Syrians, they created the environment of Eden and created the paradigm of Eve as the instigator of the fall of humanity. This was, you might say, Act 1 of Anu as God. It was staged to provide the human 2.0s with a clear sense of an external authority, and that they were expelled from paradise because they tried to be self-realized. It was like rebuking humanity with the fist of an angry creator who wanted his creation to remain identified with their human uniform. Kind of like saying, do not think for a moment that you can be like me. And the wingmakers wrote that this actually happened kind of like the Bible said? Yes. So the God of the Bible is this Anunnaki Lord, called on you? Yes. Why are you telling me this all now? It seems like this information changes some of the previous information you've shared. To really understand the Grand Portal, you have to understand this evolutionary process, and the only way you can understand it is to go back to the beginning of the human race. So why did Anu want to be God? Remember that the original goal was the acquisition of gold. But when the Atlanteans rejected Anu, he began to conspire with the Syrians. It was just before the flood that Anu discovered that the gold he mined was sufficient. He didn't require more. However, the notion of being a god over the Atlanteans was seductive. The Syrians and serpents felt that the idea of enslaving infinite beings and planet ecosystems was their invention. They had something that was totally unique. They were creator gods, and every other race could be ensnared in a similar type of vessel. They began to do just that. You mean enslave other races? Yes. You see the Earth had a unique quality to its core. This core was of extreme interest to the Anunnaki when they first visited Earth. It was this core that created the gravitational field that enabled the planet to become fully physical in such a way that it could support physical life. Of course other conditions needed to be present, too, but it was this core that was the real key. Working with the Syrians and serpents, they began to do the same enslavement on other planets. They replicated the core of Earth and engineered a method for implanting this core on other planets. They were essentially terraforming a planet by cloning and installing Earth's core. So I guess the real question is, if you believe this, what are humans today? Are we simply more of the same? 
Are we human 2.0? When I said the human uniform evolves, it does, but this evolution is on a track, a pre-programmed track. The intent was to have Anu return on a cloud, the whole second coming was going to be the stage entrance for Anu. Humanity would evolve in such a way that his re-entry into our consciousness would be understood to be a good thing. Humanity's salvation. We would all be his children, and the glory of God would be upon the earth. That was the plan. From before the time of Jesus, that was the plan. Marduk programmed the entire... How long can these beings live? Again, the beings like Marduk or Enki or Anu are not based in space-time. They are infinite beings, meaning they have no end. They don't have an age. Neither do we. I'm trying to wrap my mind around all of this, but I'm finding it very hard to believe that human beings are simply uniforms for a programmed existence. Let me go back to your previous question about what humanity is now. The functional implants of the human interface are perfectly integrated within the human vessel. They operate seamlessly. So seamlessly, we do not know that they are not us. We have no choice in the way. We think our thoughts and emotions are us, that this space-time is what our thoughts and emotions exist in. Even the thought of the God, Heaven, Hell, Soul, Masters, all of these things, they are part of the program. It is integrated in both the dimension of the Earth plane and the afterlife. The afterlife is part of the deception. Tell me more about this interface and its functional implants. The I brain was the key element that the Anunnaki needed to design to make the functional implants operate. This is in Human 1.0. In Human 2.0 it was the DNA. Once this was achieved, the Syrians could design the consciousness framework, the human consciousness. Human consciousness is the key to suppressing an infinite being. Human consciousness, or the triad of consciousness is composed of three interactive layers. The first layer is universal mind or unconscious, and this forms the link between the individual human and the entire species. This layer is what enables all of us to see what everyone sees, feel what everyone else feels, know what everyone else knows. It is the perfect way to unify a species in separation. In fact, that is the way we feel unification, through the unconscious mind. The next layer of consciousness is the genetic mind, as the wing makers refer to it, or subconscious, in the case of Sigmund Freud. This forms the link between the individual and their family tree or genetics. This is where bloodlines are expressed. And then there is the conscious mind. This is the unique individual perception and expression, what most of us call our personality and character, which is built on this layer. The conscious mind of the individual is heavily influenced by the genetic mind, especially between birth and the age of seven or eight. By that time the influence is all-encompassing. Remember that the Anunnaki created the biological form, the body, the Syrians created the functional implants, and Marduk executed the programming of these functional implants so they would evolve along a program path, leading to the return of Anu. This was expressed in the hierarchical structure of humanity that speaks of God and Masters in religious and esoteric texts. This was all part of the design to create various religions and esoteric cults that would support a vast hierarchy and order the human species into master-student relationships, and then create a multi-leveled afterlife that would reward those who believed and were obedient to their god or masters. You see, the whole principle that was behind this entire endeavor could be summed up in one word, separation. Everything exists in separation, within the earth plane and its afterlife planes as well. But, according to the wing makers, what is real is that we are all imbued with equality and oneness, not through the unconscious mind, which only links us in separation, but rather through the life essence that is us. And this life essence is sovereign and integral. It is I am we are. No one is above, no one is below. No one is better, no one is lesser. But you're saying everything is a lie? Everything I mean everything we've been taught to believe in is a deception. How is that possible, or, or even believable? It's possible because the beings that have enslaved humanity designed a world, to which we adjusted over eons of time. We evolved into it in such a manner that we became lost in our world. The veils that have been placed over us are opaque. So much so that people operate as human uniforms unaware that everything around them is illusory. It is a programmed reality that is not real. The wing makers say everything is simply sound holographically organized to look real. It's depressing. Only when you consider the scope of the deception and the way in which humanity has allowed it to rule their behaviors. The good news is that you're hearing about this now. It doesn't feel like good news. Each person can step out of the illusion. There is no master here. 
No God is going to come down and make it happen for us. No ETs. No one. It is each of us. This is what is meant by I am.